the smallest capital in europe by roy trevor this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the smallest capital in europe although montenegro possesses two seaports of her own the traveller to setinia does not make use of either of them on account of their distance from the capital he journeys instead to kataro the austrian seaport at the foot of the black mountain here there is a wonderful harbour formed by nature called the bachi di kataro an absolutely landlocked save for a narrow outlet into the adriatic three great bays strongly resembling lakes spread themselves out in the radial manner of a starfish and by way of further likeness they have often been compared with the fjords of norway or in a lesser degree the locks of scotland as the steamer sails up the Baki di Cataro, the traveller catches his first glimpse of Montenegro, which rises precipitously almost from the water's edge and forms a great barrier or jagged tableland some five thousand feet in height. Austria's most southerly province, called Dalmatia, extends here in a tiny strip of territory barely half a mile broad, but effectually separating Montenegro from the sea. Kataro lies at the extremity of the farthest landlocked bay, and so near is the giant Black Mountain that the town can scarcely find room, the little white houses looking as though some eastern genie had in joke picked them all up and thrown them hard against the towering mountain, that while some houses had tumbled back to the water's edge, the remainder had stuck fast to where they were hurled, seemingly climbing and clinging as by a miracle to the precipitous rock face as the steamer makes its way slowly to the quay the traveller has pointed out to him what looks like a long irregular white scratch on the mountain side which zigzags backwards and forwards above the town somewhat resembling a piece of cotton thrown carelessly upon a dark cushion it is the giant staircase the only portal by which one may enter montenegro and what from below looks simply like a narrow streak is in reality a fine carriage road built in the face of the precipice by dint of marvellous skill and years of unflagging labour kataro itself is exceptionally full of interest possessing as it does narrow italian streets and a beautiful old world harbour to this hive of civilization comes a crowd of montenegrin peasants bringing their heavy baskets of market produce down the long zigzags of the staircase but some look terribly ill at ease for the men's hands are forever clutching at their empty belts the austrian government wisely compels them to leave their rifles and revolvers at home or any rate at the frontier it is well here to state clearly that there is no love lost between austria and montenegro but i certainly do not intend to discuss balkan politics at present the panoramic drive up into the heart of the black mountain is a glorious and entrancing memory giving the traveller the vivid impression that he is in some rising balloon or airship for as he proceeds on his way the road climbs higher and higher winding this way and that taking advantage of every irregularity in the precipice face yet always ascending seemingly without end now and then the traveller if he is so minded May drop a stone over the road's edge that stone will probably fall upon the self-same road a thousand feet beneath looking down from the top of the ascent the serpentine turns seen beneath closely resemble the rungs of a ladder raised against the mountainside presently to our view the still waters of the bocci are reinforced by the other two arms and beyond them for the glorious vista to the horizon lies the great blue glittering expanse of the adriatic sea four thousand five hundred feet above the sea the traveller takes his last look upon kataro at his feet and the ocean beyond and rounding a turn in the road he enters the rock-strewn kingdom of montenegro at once the scene is changed a perfect wilderness of rock crag and boulder confronts him and he gathers his first vivid and lasting impression of the Hernagora, 
upon the much frequented high road to Setinia, the traveller can gain no adequate conception of the true life of the people, and therefore we need not linger any further on this our journey to the capital. However, there is one place of exceptional interest, Njagusi, for it was here that King Nicholas was born in a very unpretentious dwelling, and we pass it as we quit this small village of low stone-built houses. Again, a further climb through the same bleak gray rocks, and after a while the road descends towards a little plain hemmed in by eternal mountain peaks, and looking not unlike the interior of some Brobdingnagian egg cup. At the far end of this miniature plain nestles a cluster of houses. We have reached Setinia, the smallest capital in the world. Apart from stirring historical memories, it cannot be said that there is much of spectacular interest to be found in Setinia. There are no imposing buildings as in Belgrade or Sofia, no theaters, no crowded streets, neither electric trams nor trains, nor indeed any traffic as we understand the word. Setinia is virtually a big village, somewhat resembling a South African township, consisting of a broad street lined with low, two-storied houses and a large market square. Everything is of the simplest kind, almost primitive, and the king's palace is only dignified by that name on account of its really being the largest house, and the daily life of the royal family is as simple, open, and unaffected as that of the poorest peasant. What strikes the stranger the most is the motley assortment of colored garments donned by the people. The first impression is that some special fete is being held, and it is only after a sojourn of a week or so in the land that we begin to realize this almost prodigal phase of brilliance is but one among many distinguishing features in the ordinary life of this interesting little people. Although the Montenegrin nation is the reverse of wealthy, not far removed from poverty, in fact, yet from three to forty pounds are paid ungrudgingly for a national costume, and this inordinate love of finery, coupled with a passion for gambling, alas, serve to keep this chivalrous nation poor. The men wear a long coat, shaped in at the waist, and with the skirt reaching to the knees, made of fine cloth, colored either light blue, green, or red, and open at the front. The waistcoat is of scarlet cloth and heavily embroidered with gold thread. Round the waist there is a silk sash through which is thrust a revolver. Covering the legs, the poorer classes wear tight, white felt leggings. Those who can afford it have adopted high Russian boots of soft black leather. The little round hat I referred to in the first chapter is worn by everyone. Its crown is of red cloth to signify the blood shed upon the gray rocks, and on it are embroidered five gold circles, each symbolically representing a hundred years of fighting. In the center are the letters H.I., the Greek form of Nicholas I. The outside band of the cap is black, in memory of a great battle fought long ago at the time Turkey first conquered the Balkan kingdoms. The women are dressed just as brilliantly, wearing long coats and sashes like those of the men. When you think of a whole country dressed in such an extraordinary fashion, it is very easy to imagine the everyday gay appearance of the public streets. Unfortunately, there are very few ancient monuments in Montenegro, since the continual inroads of the Turks effectually destroyed all traces of many that must have formerly existed. In Cetinje, the oldest building is the monastery, which is perched against the gray rocks, and above it stands the Kula, or stone tower, that used to be surmounted with iron spikes each of them garnished with a newly severed Turkish head. Many people in Setinia can remember the last occasion when they bore their ghastly burdens. In the monastery, the hereditary burying place of the kings, lives Vladika, or Archbishop of the Black Mountains. Any morning at daybreak, one may see King Nicholas worshipping at the tombs of his ancestors, for the king is an early riser and is generally put in a hard day's work long before most people at home are ready for breakfast. In front of the monastery 
a number of heavy Turkish cannon are placed in rows, the spoil of the last campaign, and the sight of them affords great satisfaction to the inhabitants. In the large open market square, always a prominent feature in Montenegrin towns, the sun blazes down with insufferable power, and the peasants are only too glad to take advantage of the welcome shelter that the few leafy trees afford them. Until the traveler has grown accustomed to the brilliant native dresses, he is ever imagining himself transported to some medieval town whose inhabitants are parading in all the glory of ancestral barbaric adornment. Even the houses of the different government ministers are but tiny two-storied buildings, and it is very strange to see the emblazoned coats of arms over the narrow doors of these unpretentious dwellings. In the post office, the man who sells stamps or takes her telegram is dressed in the same gorgeous fashion, with revolver stuck prominently in belt. This habit of carrying firearms is general throughout the land, and one of the most dreaded punishments for a man is to be deprived of his weapons for any period whatever. Towards the Albanian frontier, we shall find that in addition to the revolver, a rifle, knife, and hand jar, long heavy sword, are carried, together with plenty of ammunition. A man without firearms is a man without freedom, and thou may as well take away my brothers as my rifle, are two well-known maxims. The king will often stop a man in the street and demand an inspection of his weapons, and if by any chance they are found to be dirty or unloaded, the punishment is extremely severe, for King Nicholas is adamant upon this point, and rightly so. As the supreme head of a fighting nation and the descendant of a long line of warrior kings, it is hardly surprising that King Nicholas should look every inch a leader of men. He is both tall, the prevailing feature of the national physique, and broad-shouldered, and despite his seventy-two years, his back is as straight and his movements as strong and vigorous as a young man's. Coming to the throne at the age of twenty, the king has seen his country advance from comparative obscurity to its present honorable position among the nations. For over a score of years, he waged fierce battle with the Turks, leading his men in the thick of the fight, proving his ability as a general, and by a hundred brave deeds his personal courage. In times of peace, too, he has striven really hard for his beloved country, both diplomatically with the powers of Europe and in personal organization of the scant resources of the little kingdom. He is today a crack shot with rifle and pistol, as he is also a past master in the leadership of men. One foreign minister remarked jokingly that not a bird's nest could fall in Montenegro without the king issuing an order for its reinstatement. It is said that King Nicholas knows each of his subjects by name, and certainly all look upon him, their gospodor, with passionate esteem and reverence. The humblest peasant may freely obtain an audience and recount to his sovereign any wrong he may have suffered, happy in the conviction that it will be righted, and I have often watched with the keenest pleasure King Nicholas holding his informal morning court upon the steps of his unpretentious palace his sturdy and imposing figure clad in the national dress seated and surrounded by a few officials the steps lined by his perianiques the name given to his picked bodyguard on account of the feathers worn in their caps with the utmost speed the audiences take place now and then a prisoner is led up sentenced and the next called it is all so easy and so simple for the king's word is law and neither liar nor traitor could meet those steady eyes of his that seemed to pierce one through and through. Up to quite recent times, King Nicholas dispensed justice in this primitive way until cases grew too numerous for his personal attention. He then instituted courts of justice and appointed judges. It speaks volumes for the decisions of these courts that even Mohammedans and Albanians from over the frontier bring their cases for trial before a Montenegrin judge in preference to their own Moslem one. King Nicholas has a great veneration for England, and he was a special favorite of Queen Victoria, who personally decorated him. As we ride through the land, we shall find everywhere 
evidences of king nicholas's genius and the overwhelming respect and esteem in which he is held the montenegrin army was founded fifteen years ago by king nicholas to replace the volunteers the regulations are simplicity itself every man between the ages of sixteen and sixty is forced to serve this service they render almost instinctively and it is therefore scarcely surprising that compulsory service is extremely popular in montenegro and that under capable instructors the men quickly make splendid soldiers after four months service they return with rifles to their homes and are then to ensure efficiency subject to a weekly drill in place of the long coats to which i have already referred they wear red short-sleeved jackets and look thoroughly businesslike there are few military distinctions the different grades or ranks merely donning special badges upon the fronts of their little round caps russia has supplied them with up-to-date field pieces and rifles cavalry and heavy artillery being useless in mountainous montenegro from the same foreign source the country is also provided with much other valuable assistance russia renders all possible help to montenegro because they are both slav nations and belong to the same greek church for the same reasons however austria has persistently remained a sworn enemy of montenegro behind austria there really stands germany armed to the teeth and behind russia looms france thus you see that even petty quarrels between montenegro and turkey may quite possibly involve the great powers of europe in a terrible and disastrous war but then as i have before remarked i must not allow myself to become entangled in that vast maze of international complication known as european politics there are two particularly fine buildings in Setinje, the russian and austrian embassies and two the new barracks are especially popular there is a tiny theatre open for a few weeks in the summer season where king nicholas's plays are produced for the king is a famous poet and has written many beautiful odes besides having composed battle songs for his various regiments there is also a small but well-equipped hospital and a high school for girls and boys the climate in summer is excellent though very hot but for the eight months of winter it is terribly severe and much snow then falls every other house seems to be a cafe where the men congregate of an evening and though they occasionally consume large quantities of spirits they never grow more than noisy in the remoter parts of montenegro a man will often fire off his revolver in the air particularly if he is excited by way of letting off steam a practice rather disconcerting to any nervous-minded folk but then you seldom find any nervous-minded folk in montenegro not even among the few visitors there are no shops as we know them in fact there isn't a large piece of glass in the whole place you simply walk through an open doorway into a small room on the floor of which or on the walls are exposed the goods or merchandise consisting of clothes weapons embroideries shawls scarves etc and the man who serves you carries his revolver fully loaded and very probably towers above you quite six inches End of The Smallest Capital in Europe by Roy Trevor Read by Betty B. My Cases of Old Sermons by Richard Glover This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. My eye has just fallen on this cold wintry night on my old sermons. There they are before my eyes as I write, on a wide undershelf of one of my bookcases. And as I have been looking at them in a somewhat sad and reflective mood, being all alone tonight, they have suggested some thoughts which I feel strangely moved to attempt to write down. It may be that to do so will be useful to some of the younger clergy, and I hope not without interest to some older ones. At present my thoughts seem a heterogeneous mingle, but they impress me greatly. Tennyson's touching lines rise to mind. Oh, would that my tongue could utter the thoughts that arise in me. 
but I greatly fear my pen will not do so adequately. However, I feel inwardly moved to attempt to do so, and I obey the motion. Perhaps it may be of God. One thing I plainly foresee, that from the very nature of my subject, I must necessarily be more egotistical than I like to be, and so prove a butt for uncharity. But that I must risk for the sake of my younger brethren. Most of our sterling worth is what our own experience teaches. But how can one write of one's own experience without a very frequent use of the personal pronoun? Elia's delightful essays are very full of the ego, but we more than forgive it. We feel that it is that very fact that constitutes their chief charm. What a loss we should have had if Charles Lamb had been possessed of an affected modesty, or if he had been more afraid of Mrs. Gundry's uncharity. First, I must say, those cases look very neat and orderly, and I say this with the less hesitation because the merit of that is not mine, or only to a partial degree, but another's. I am not a sempstress, but they are made up in brown Holland cases tied up with red tape, in bundles containing some twenty-five sermons in each, and bachelors may infer something from this. On the front of each bundle are the numbers of the sermons written as thus, 1-25, and so on, till now the number reaches to over 1,300. Near them are my sermon register books, in which each sermon has been, from the commencement of my ministry, entered with the particulars thus, number, text, subject, where preached, when, remarks. I should add that my sermon register has another department containing columns under each book and chapter of the Bible, in which each sermon is entered thus, Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26, number 296, chapter 2, verse number, and so on, so that I can at once see the sermon I have preached on any particular verse, or whether I have never preached on it. A friend of mine also keeps a common Bible in which he underlines each verse he has preached on, and puts in the margin the number of his sermon on that verse, a very convenient plan, and I wish now I had had it hinted to me in my early days. For through not always consulting my register, I have several times forgotten that I have ever preached on a particular text, and have written on the same text two sermons even in the same year. Sometimes, I confess, I have discovered it to my mortification. Then you always preach written sermons? No, not always. I sometimes preach extempore from brief notes, but I always adopt the same plan even with my notes. I preach, as a rule, extempore on weeknight evenings, and sometimes on Sunday. But I much prefer my written sermons, and generally those of other men, and I am sure the more thoughtful and spiritual of the laity do too. And this suggests another feature in those cases of sermons yonder. About the first two hundred of them are in the ordinary large sheets, but all those after that number, and I have, as I said, over thirteen hundred, are in paper the size of what is called Albert size. I find that in my handwriting twelve pages of this size will contain a sermon of half an hour, beyond which time I now very rarely preach. I know that that is considered too long. I do not think so. At least, I can never write a sermon at all to my satisfaction under that time. I do not believe that a really good sermon, unless the delivery be very rapid, can be preached under that time. A more or less useful address may, but surely nothing that is worthy of the name of sermon. And, always supposing that the delivery be not drony, I believe the intelligent laity will think so too, the daily secular press notwithstanding. I was led to adopt my new size of sheet by hearing a very able London preacher very soon after I became a vicar. I was under the impression that he was preaching extempore. His sermon had all the effect of it, for he had an ordinary Bagster's Bible on his cushion and no apparent sign of a sermon. But I learnt that every word of his sermon was written and was in his Bible before him, and the turning over of the small leaves was hardly noticed. I said to myself, that is an excellent plan, for it seems to me to combine the advantages of the written sermon with all the effect of an extempore one, 
and from that hour I adopted it, to my great comfort and satisfaction. And, provided a preacher will take the pains, as surely he ought, to read his sermon over four times before he preaches it, he will get to know it so well, and to catch so well what is on the page, that he will be able to deliver it with perfect freedom, and without any appearance, and, if he will take the pains to tutor his voice to a natural delivery, without any of the tone of reading. Anyway, I felt most thankful for that practical hint. I like to see a man preaching from the Bible, literally. I like to see the book in the pulpit, and not to be poked away, even when the text is read out of it. It seems to me more like preaching the word, and less like an essay upon some subject of it. And I believe it has a good and important effect on the minds of the people to see God's word in the minister's hands, or lying open before him, and for texts, when they are quoted, to be read out of it, and not from out the sheets of a manuscript. Then, further, as to this mere material form of the sermon, I would earnestly counsel every young preacher to be very careful of his calligraphy. I speak painfully here, for at first I made a great mistake in regard to this point. In my old sheet sermons my writing was large and bold, so that I could read or preach them off without any bungle or fear of it. But when I adopted the smaller sheets, I foolishly wrote much smaller, and with lines very close together. That did not matter much when my eyes were young, but lo, now I find that the sermons of those days, many of them, are useless so far as preaching them again is concerned. Yet from the first, and for the sake of my younger brethren, I must be pardoned for appearing egotistical, I made it a conscious to take such pains with my sermons that I feel that I could preach many of them now with satisfaction and advantage. But owing to my folly in not looking sufficiently forward to the time when the eyesight would not be so good, I wrote in this very small type, and in these close lines, and now I either cannot preach even the best of them at all, or only by a serious amount of conning. For the last few years, therefore, I have put on four extra sheets of paper, and write in lines further apart and in larger type, and take altogether much more pains with the legibility of my calligraphy. Then it appears you preach your old sermons over and over again. I do not think that quite appears. The very fact that I have over 1,300 fully written sermons, and I am not very venerable yet, is a tolerably sufficient proof that I am no great sinner in that respect, especially bearing in mind that I served one parish as a curate and three as vicar, and also that I have numbers of notes of extempore sermons besides. Still, I confess, I do preach old sermons frequently. And why should I not, if I think them good enough and new enough for the people? I still, however, make it a practice to write one new full sermon a week, besides preaching new extempore ones at weekday services. But for a second or third sermon on a Sunday, I very often preach an old one, making it a rule, however, never to preach the same sermon to the same congregation till after a lapse of eight or ten years, quite a generation in a London congregation. I leave these minor points, which, however, are more important than they may appear, with impressing upon my younger brethren in the ministry the very great importance of preparing the delivery of their written sermons. It is a common fallacy that a written sermon must be read, or, at any rate, that it must appear to be read by the reading tone that it necessitates. But I hold that it does not necessitate it at all. That all depends upon the preacher of it. If he will only set himself to acquire and practice a natural speaking tone, it may be delivered with all the naturalness of an extempore sermon. Indeed, we know many extempore preachers whose tone is as much like a read sermon as though they actually were reading it. On the other hand, we know preachers of written sermons who so manage their delivery that it has all the appearance of extempore reading. An actor is really delivering a written text, yet he speaks as though he were speaking impromptu. It is all a matter of pains, drill and practice, and the acquiring of a speaking delivery is worth any amount of such labour. For if anything is more damaging than another to the effectiveness of preaching, it is the drony sing-song sermon tone. From it may God deliver our Church of England pulpit, and yet how strangely our young curates adopt it. 
Shall I appear egotistic again if, in looking at those sermon cases, I thank God that his grace enabled me to take so much pains with them? Yet I will undertake the risk of this for the sake of my younger brethren. There is not a sermon there that was written on the Saturday night, the too common time which many young preachers give to their sermons. Hardly one of them that was not commenced on Friday morning, and many of them on Thursday morning, and that not until the text had previously been thought out and a skeleton of the plan prepared. And what a satisfaction and comfort now to think of that. They could tell of many a day's pleasure being sacrificed for their sake, and of great toil gone through. Toil, they fill me with wonder how this hand, to say nothing of the toil of heart and brain, could have written those great piles of manuscript, especially when I think of all the books and literary articles, published and unpublished, I have written. I have little doubt that I should have got on in the worldly sense much better if I had saved myself such toil, and had contented myself with preaching from a note or two that I might have written on Saturday night, sermonettes of ten or twelve minutes, spiced with one or two pretty and sensational anecdotes culled from some cyclopedia of those articles." but I had to consider not getting on, but eternity, and to preach with an eye to the great account of myself and my hearers, and in that view I never regret my toil, unrequited though it may appear to have been as far as this world is concerned. Then, again, as I look at them, I can conscientiously say that not one of them is a copied sermon, nor is there one sentence in one of them, save avowed quotations, that is borrowed, or that is not strictly my own. I have read sermons, of course, on many of the texts that were infinitely better than they are, but I made it a rule that, inferior or otherwise, I would not beg, borrow, or steal my sermons from any man. The worse for my people, some might say, perhaps so, but that was my resolve, and by God's help I have kept to it all these years." I have read all available matter on my texts, but not till after I had thought it out for myself, and even then if thoughts were suggested by that reading, as of course they were, I have always brought them out and clothed them in my own way. The plan has been rich in reward, and sermon composition is now hardly a toil, but a facile pleasure. Let that encourage the young toiler, and help him to persevere. Ah me! It is a very solemn and pathetic pile. How many hundreds who heard many of those written words are now in eternity? Yes, I may say hundreds. More than a generation has passed away since many of them were written, and my entire ministry has been in large parishes and large churches. One of my churches, in which I preached as vicar for eight years, held 1,800 people, and it was generally well filled. My other churches have also been large ones. Many of those sermons have been preached in the ears of officers and soldiers who were killed in the Crimea and in Indian battles. Many who heard them have settled in foreign lands and died there. Some who heard them have been murdered. On one is written, This was the last sermon heard by Lieutenant R. two days before he was cruelly murdered at. Some were preached about murders committed in my parish some before executions, some on the death of Prince Albert, some on the marriage of the Prince of Wales, some on famines, wars, earthquakes, and eclipses that have occurred. Indeed, they are almost a brief passing record of English history for a generation. And oh, what domestic calamities they refer to, and what sad events in congregational life. And some, alas, are blotted by my tears over personal bereavement and ministerial trials of a kind that now make my heart ache. There is one sermon there, half written, never to be completed. I have never had the heart to finish it, and never shall. I was stopped in the middle of it by a telegram that told me of the greatest loss I have ever yet known. Little did I think, when I wrote that last sentence, that no other would be added to it forever, and that... After that sentence, life would never be the same again. Yes, there in those cases are the most solemn thoughts of my life of manhood stereotyped before my eyes, some of the saddest, some of the happiest. And what have those thoughts, those words, wrought? It is an awful thought that they were not spoken into the air to be lost. As I look at their written record, the words of the Apostle come into my mind. 
to the one we are a savour of life unto life, and to the other of death unto death. Some, I hope, nay, no, have been the former. I see there one sermon that is often a source of comfort to me, and a sign that, in hours of depression, tells me that the Lord hath spoken by me. And I look at it as David might have looked at his five stones out of the brook, or as the Israelites might have looked at the sword wherewith he smote off the head of the giant, or as the early Christians may have looked on Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons. It was preached on a mission which I undertook to six different villages around Maidstone, in days when missions were little known. The text was Job 7 verse 6. A daughter of a then celebrated MP was among one of the audiences, and it pleased God to bless that sermon to her conversion. The fact is mentioned in an interesting memoir of her, which was published, for not many months after hearing it, she died, rejoicing in the God of her salvation. There is another of like interest. It was preached in my own church to a large congregation. Therein was a young man who was living in sin. In the sermon I asked this question, is there any young man here who is kept back from Christ by any Drusilla, etc.? I received some time after a letter from that young man, saying that that question entered his conscience like an arrow from heaven, and he said to himself, Yes, I am. He went home, shut himself up in his room, fully confessed his sin to God, sought pardon, obtained it, and resolved to give up that hindrance. His subsequent life has shown how true a conversion it was. For thirty years he has walked in the way of the Lord consistently, and is now a superintendent in a church Sunday school. There is another on the text, Choose ye this day, and so on. That sermon awoke at least two that I heard of to decision for Christ. I shall never forget my joy at the letter received from one of them. He walked well for some time, but, alas, soon after he removed to another parish, where were no spiritual advantages, and so fell into temptation and a snare. Whether he was ever recovered out of the snare of the devil, I cannot tell. These are sad ministerial experiences, showing us that deep convictions and resolutions are not always true conversions, and that it is a very perilous thing for even a truly converted man to remove into a spiritual arctic circle. People rarely think of their soul's welfare in regard to change of situation, but it often prevents fruit coming to perfection, or leads to sad backsliding. Let me hope that this interesting case was only one of the latter kind, and that the Good Shepherd brought back the wandering sheep to his fold. One of those sermons had a very remarkable effect, and it may be well to note it, since it shows what great issues may flow from our pulpit utterances, how God may use them in shaping the destinies of men, and how prayerful we ought to be, therefore, in seeking for divine guidance in preparing them. I was preaching on Lot's choice of the country round Sodom, and I described the case of a young man being tempted to leave home for the Australian gold fields for the sake of mere temporal advantages, and going where there were no means of grace, but manifold temptations and corrupting examples, and of the consequent peril to his soul. A young man of whom I knew absolutely nothing was present, who, as I afterwards was informed, was just about to sail to that place with those very ends. He was so struck by the applicability of what he heard to his case that he resolved to abandon his intention and to remain in England. I remember another curious case. I was, in one of those sermons, describing a character. After the sermon, a young man came to the vestry and wished to speak to me. I saw he looked very excited, not to say angry. You wish to speak to me, I said. Yes, he replied. I want to know who it is that has been telling you about me and what you mean by speaking of me in the pulpit as you have tonight. Sir, I said, I have not the least idea who you are. I do not know your face or your name, and no one certainly has ever spoken to me about you. He could hardly believe it for he felt certain that I was describing him, and that someone must have been talking to me about him. Thus, through the preaching of the Christ, the thoughts of many hearts are revealed. Some of those sermons recall other interesting reminiscences of an encouraging character. Here are two that a pious English bishop heard among the Alps, and which he thanked me for very warmly. Not long after, he died in the act of prayer. There is another, a copy of which is now in St. Petersburg. 
I was heard in Switzerland by a lady resident in the Russian capital, who asked for a copy of a sermon that she found so edifying and comforting. Such tokens from memory often cheer and support when signs and tokens do not appear in one's ordinary ministry. It is great thing to know that the Lord has used us as his instruments. But those cases suggest other memories of a sadder kind. How terrible to think of the truths that some of them contain, and to remember that this one and that one heard them, and heard them in vain. I can remember many who lived without God in this world and died without him, who, I know, heard numbers of those sermons, nay, and I know felt them. One was a very melancholy case. He was a man in good position and of great influence in his locality, and being one of the old church and king school of Tories, he always attended his church, at least in the morning, and at this he was most regular and even attentive. He did not like the truth preached, but he would not have been worthy of church and queen if he had not been in his parish church once a day. He was very friendly with me and even kind, but the truth never seemed to come home to him in its power. I never knew, however, the full meaning of the words, the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, until one day, when he came to me to use his influence with me to vote for a certain candidate at the borough election, I told him, I would do anything I could for him, but I could not vote against my conscience. He angrily replied, Oh, put your conscience in your pocket. What a revelation of a state of mind that could say that, even to his minister. There, too, are sermons that were heard by some who died drunkards and the victims of other vices. I can remember how I distinctly thought of them when I preached this sermon and that, and that that sermon was specially written with a view to impress one whose face seems now to be photographed upon it, but who was not impressed, and who, if he were, resisted the impression and lived and died, notwithstanding, a godless and a wicked man. O oh, my old sermons, I look at you with awe. Were they as faithful with those souls as they might have been? I read some of them over again, now that those souls who heard them are in eternity, and I really hardly see how they could well have been more faithful. That is a comfort now, but I have been thinking, as I have been gazing, what witnesses against those unhappy souls are there lying dumbly. Will there be, will there not be, a resurrection of those sermons? The paper of them will one day be ashes or dust, but will they not rise again? O oh God, may they not be witnesses against myself, but how solemn to think that those fading sheets that lie there will be factors in the judgment of the great day. End of My Cases of Old Sermons by Richard Glover Negro Slavery in Wisconsin by John Nelson Davidson from the Wisconsin Historical Society's Journal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It is a free country. No slavery can be admitted here. Thus, in 1833, Reverend David Lowry wrote of what was soon to be Wisconsin. And at the centennial celebration of the settlement of Marietta, Ohio, April 7, 1888, Senator George F. Keir, speaking of the old Northwest Territory and the states that have seceded, used these words. Here was the first human government which absolute civil and religious liberty has always prevailed. Here no witch was ever hanged or burned, no heretic was ever molested. Here no slave was ever born or dwelt. When older states or nations, where the chains of human bondage have been broken, shall utter the proud boast, with a great price I obtain this freedom, each sister state of this imperial group, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin, may lift up her queenly head with the yet prouder answer, but I was born free. We could wish that these statements were entirely accurate. It is true that the witchcraft delusion that has slain its hundreds of thousands of victims in Germany, France, Britain, and its twenty or even more in our own land, found none here. But Negroes were actually held as slaves in Indiana, Illinois, and even in Wisconsin. Doubtless there was some also in Ohio. 
it is from the lips of living witnesses that i have part of the story of negro slavery in wisconsin one of these is more than a witness he is doubtless the only living man who held slaves in wisconsin it is to his credit that he became also their emancipator i speak of george wallace jones now of dubuque iowa the last delegate in congress from michigan territory to write and fold the biography of general jones he was brigadier in the territorial militia under governor dodge would be to write a great part of the early history of southwestern wisconsin one of the landmarks in that part of the state is cincinnawa mound almost on the dividing line between wisconsin and illinois and about six miles east of dubuque iowa in 1827 mr jones by advice of his physician left his missouri home and came northward in march of that year he made claim under the custom of those times to a piece of land this he afterwards secured by title from the united states government being the first man to prove up pre-exemption rights in the mineral point land office opened about eighteen thirty six and thus the first to enter therein a quarter section of land the noble mound already named stands upon the tract of land to which mr jones made this early claim here he established a trading post and here he held about a dozen or fifteen slaves brought from missouri at some date not remembered by general jones now an octogenarian one of his negro men whom he calls sam brought suit against him for wages the case was tried before judge dunn so well known in our early history according to general jones recollection the judge charged the jury that the negro's legal status was determined by the statute of the state whence he had been brought and that consequently he could not be party to a suit such a ruling does not seem consistent with the fact that a jury was summoned it may be that the old gentleman's memory is at fault and the suggestion of an eminent member of the milwaukee bar has led to the thought that perhaps the judge held that general jones's financial obligation to the negro was determined by the relation which in lieu of a contract had existed between them in the state whence they both came widely different as are these possible rulings of the court the result to the unfortunate negro as far as the immediate object of his suit was concerned was practically the same to adopt the language of a certain real or supposed country newspaper he succeeded in getting nothing probably he was already practically free in about eighteen forty two general jones emancipated all whom he had held in slavery strictly speaking this action on his part was but the recognition of a right which he knew they already possessed practically it was very likely the breaking up of an establishment which had been held together by the bonds of kindliness and mutual good will general jones who speaks with great frankness of his own holding of slaves in wisconsin tells us also of like action on the part of governor dodge yet the cases are not precisely alike for dodge before removing to wisconsin called together his negroes and promised freedom after five years service to such of them as would go with him to his proposed new home this he established only a few miles from the site whereon was afterwards built the little city of dodgeville he more than fulfilled his promise for at the appointed time he not only set his negroes free but also gave each man forty acres of land and a yoke of oxen another of the living witnesses to the fact of slavery in wisconsin is ex-judge joseph trotter mills of lancaster among his early cases was one brought to compel a so-called master to set free a colored man held in grant county as a slave the deed of manumission executed on this occasion is the honored judge thinks the only document of the kind on record in our state in eighteen thirty four when he became one of the founders of the cumberland presbyterian now the congregational church of prayer to shame young mills protested against the sin of slavery for one of the brotherhood andrew cochran held slaves in missouri of this church david lowry was the first pastor but there was one case of the actual holding of a slave at prayer to shame itself it was that of a mulatto named day he attracted the attention of the late rev alfred brunson who thinking that day had a mind to be useful in pastoral or mission service raised money and secured the mulatto's freedom but he proved either to be unfit for the service desired of him or unwilling to enter into it and the investment from the missionary point of view
proved to be a total loss this event seems to have been a matter of intense mortification to dr brunson and of keen delight to his enemies but platteville has the unpleasant distinction of being the only place in wisconsin where slaves were not only actually held but whence they were also returned to slave soil and to legal bondage the latter case was that of two girls held by the wife of rev james mitchell a minister of the methodist episcopal church when it became unsafe to try to keep them as slaves any longer in wisconsin they were taken to st louis intense feeling was aroused in platteville by this shameful and illegal deed from the ecclesiastical point of view wisconsin was then embraced within the limits of the rock river conference before this body accordingly mr mitchell was tried for kidnapping he pleaded that he was not the owner of the slaves whether on this ground or not i cannot say but by a small majority he secured acquittal green bay has place in our narrative for the venerable jeremiah porter doctor of divinity of beloit remembers distinctly a mulatto girl who was held there as a slave in later years dr porter met her as a free woman according to his wish no name save his own is given in connection with this case john myers of platteville who gave me most of the facts i have mentioned concerning the two slave girls of that place tells of another case in which it is best that no names be given for the relation was probably that of voluntary rather than of enforced servitude yet mr myers thinks that when the census of 1840 was taken the person was reported as a slave with the single exception known to dr porter these slaves were all brought to wisconsin in the first of the two great currents of early immigration that came hither this was from the south the older west kentucky and tennessee were then considered to be western rather than southern states and from missouri it was by way of the mississippi that most of these emigrants reached wisconsin that a few of them brought slaves is not a matter of surprise many like rev david lowry judge mills and a personal friend of the writer the late benjamin kilbourne of jamestown a type of man less known but not less earnest came with an abhorrence of human bondage samuel mitchell first pastor of the methodist episcopal church of platteville who though a native of virginia emancipated his slaves on becoming a christian certainly put to shame his less worthy son already named governor dodge was another man who did better than his son both were in the united states senate the former from wisconsin the latter from iowa when the wilmot proviso came before that body the son augustus c dodge voted against it the father in its favor the second of the two great streams of early immigration hither came by way of the great lakes and for the most part from new england and new york it was distinctly anti-slavery in sentiment among the men who formed part of this movement were many who in later years resisted manfully the abominable fugitive slave law but against human slavery itself and its more immediate effects the abolitionists who came hither from the south made here and elsewhere an earlier fight and against greater odds won victory end of negro slavery in wisconsin by john nelson davidson treaty between japan and russia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by avai in august 2020 treaty between japan and russia with reply of his excellency the korean minister for foreign affairs memorandum the representatives of russia and japan at seoul having conferred under the identical instructions from their respective governments have arrived at the following conclusions while leaving the matter of his majesty's the king of korea return to the palace entirely to his own discretion and judgment the representatives of russia and japan will friendly advise his majesty to return to that place when no doubts could be entertained concerning his safety the japanese representative on his part gives the assurance that the most complete and effective measures will be taken for the control of japanese soshi the present cabinet ministers have been appointed by his majesty by his own free will 
and most of them have held ministerial or other high offices during the last two years and are known to be liberal and moderate men. The two representatives will always aim at recommending His Majesty to appoint liberal and moderate men as ministers and to show clemency to his subjects. The representative of Russia quite agrees with the representative of Japan that at the present state of affairs in Korea, it may be necessary to have Japanese guards stationed at some places for the protection of the Japanese telegraph line between Fusan and Seoul, and that these guards, now consisting of three companies of soldiers, should be withdrawn as soon as possible and replaced by gendarmes, who will be distributed as follows. Fifty men at Fusan, fifty men at Kahung, and ten men each at ten intermediate posts between Fusan and Seoul. This distribution may be liable to some changes, but the total number of the gendarme force shall never exceed two hundred men, who will afterwards gradually be withdrawn from such places where peace and order have been restored by the Korean government. For the protection of the Japanese settlements at Seoul and the open ports, against possible attacks by the Korean populace, two companies of Japanese troops may be stationed at Seoul, one company at Fusan and one at Wonsan, each company not to exceed 200 men. These troops will be quartered near the settlements and shall be withdrawn as soon as no apprehension of such attacks could be entertained. For the protection of the Russian legation and consulates, the Russian government may also keep guards not exceeding the number of Japanese troops at those places, and which will be withdrawn as soon as tranquility in the interior is completely restored. Signed, C. Weber, representative of Russia, J. Komura, representative of Japan, Seoul, 14th May, 1896. Protocol the Secretary of State, Prince Lobanov Rostovsky, Foreign Minister of Russia, and the Marshal Marquis Yamagata, Ambassador Extraordinary of His Majesty the Emperor of Japan, having exchanged their views on the situation of Korea, agreed upon the following articles. 1. For the remedy of the financial difficulties of Korea, the governments of Russia and Japan will advise the Korean government to retrench all superfluous expenditure and to establish a balance between expenses and revenues. If, in consequence of reforms deemed indispensable, it may be necessary to have recourse to foreign loans, both governments shall by mutual consent give their support to Korea. 2. The governments of Russia and Japan shall endeavor to leave to Korea, as far as the financial and economical situation of that country will permit, the formation and maintenance of a national armed force and police, of such proportions as will be sufficient for the preservation of the internal peace, without foreign support. 3. With a view to facilitate communications with Korea, the Japanese government may continue, continuera, to administer the telegraph lines which are at present in its hands. It is reserved to Russia the rights of building a telegraph line between Seoul and her frontiers. These different lines can be repurchased by the Korean government as soon as it has the means to do so. 4. In case the above matters should require a more exact or detailed explanation, or if subsequently some other points should present themselves upon which it may be necessary to confer, the representatives of both governments shall be authorized to negotiate in a spirit of friendship. Signed, Lobanov, Yamagata. Moscow, 9th of June, 1896. The following is the exact translation of the reply sent to the Japanese minister by the Korean Minister of Foreign Affairs concerning the Russo-Japanese Convention. Ministry of Foreign Affairs, March 9th, second year of Kunyang, 1897. Sir, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your dispatch of the second instant, informing me that, on the fourteenth day of May last, a memorandum was signed at Seoul by His Excellency Mr. Komura, the former Japanese minister resident, and the Russian minister, and that, on the fourth of June of the same year, an agreement was signed at Moscow 
by His Excellency Marshal Yamagata, the Japanese ambassador, and the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Russia, and that these two documents have been laid publicly before the Imperial Diet. You further inform me that on the 26th Ultimo you received a telegram from your government, pointing out that the above-mentioned agreement and memorandum in no way reflect upon, but, on the contrary, are meant to strengthen the independence of Korea, this being the object which the governments of Japan and Russia had in view, and you cherish the confident hope that my government will not fail to appreciate this intention. In accordance with telegraphic instructions received from the Imperial Minister of Foreign Affairs, you enclose copies of the agreements referred to. I beg to express my sincere thanks for your dispatch and the information it conveys. I would observe, however, that as my government has not joined in concluding these two agreements, its freedom of action as an independent power cannot be restricted by their provisions. I have, etc. Signed, E. Wan Yong, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs. His Excellency Mr. Kato, Minister of Japan, etc. End of Treaty Between Japan and Russia with reply of His Excellency the Korean Minister for Foreign Affairs. Strength and Decency by Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To the Holy Name Society at Oyster Bay, New York, August 16, 1903. Very Reverend Dean, Reverend Clergy, and you of the Holy Name Society. I count myself fortunate in having the chance to say a word to you today, and at the outset, let me, Father Power, on behalf of my neighbors, your congregation, welcome all your guests here to Oyster Bay. I have a partial right to join in that welcome myself, for it was my good fortune in the days of Father Power's predecessor, Father Belford, to be the first man to put down a small contribution for the erection of your church here. I am particularly glad to see such a society as this flourishing as your society has flourished, because the future welfare of our nation depends upon the way in which we can combine in our men, in our young men, decency and strength. Just this morning, when attending service on the great battleship Carthage, I listened to a sermon addressed to the officers and enlisted men of the Navy, in which the central thought was that each American must be a good man or he could not be a good citizen. And one of the things dwelt upon in that sermon was the fact that a man must be clean of mouth as well as clean of life, must show by his words as well as by his actions his felty to the Almighty, if he was to be what we have a right to expect from men wearing the national uniform. We have good scriptural authority for the statement that it is not what comes into a man's mouth, but what goes out of it that counts. I am not addressing weaklings, or I should not take the trouble to come here. I am addressing strong, vigorous men who are engaged in the active, hard work of life, and life to be worth living must be a life of active and hard work. I am speaking to men engaged in the hard, active work of life, and therefore to men who will count for good or for evil. It is peculiarly incumbent upon you who have strength to set the right example to others. I ask you to remember that you cannot retain your self-respect if you are loose and foul of tongue, that a man who is to lead a clean and honorable life must inevitably suffer if his speech likewise is not clean and honorable. Every man here knows the temptations that beset all of us in this world. At times, any man will slip. I do not expect perfection but I do expect genuine and sincere effort toward being decent and cleanly in thought, in word, and in deed. As I said at the outset, I hail the work of this society as typifying one of those forces which tend to the betterment and uplifting of our social system. Our whole effort should be toward securing a combination of the strong qualities with those qualities which we term virtues. I expect you to be strong. I would not respect you if you were not. I do not want to see Christianity professed only by weaklings. I want to see it a moving spirit among men of strength. I do not expect you to lose one particle of your strength or courage by being decent. On the contrary, I should hope to see each man who is a member of this society, from his membership in it, become all the fitter to do the rough work of the world, all the fitter to work in time of peace, and if which may heaven forfend, war should come, 
all the fitter to fight in time of war. I desire to see in this country the decent men strong and the strong men decent. And until we get that combination in pretty good shape, we are not going to be, by any means, as successful as we should be. There is always a tendency among very young men and among boys who are not quite young men as yet to think that to be wicked is rather smart, to think it shows that they are men. Oh, how often you see some young fellow who boasts that he is going to see life, meaning that, that he is going to see that part of life which is a thousandfold better should remain unseen. I ask that every man here constitute himself his brother's keeper by setting an example to that younger brother which will prevent him from getting such a false estimate of life. Example is the most potent of all things. If any one of you, in the presence of younger boys, and especially the younger people of your own family, misbehaves yourself, if you use coarse and blasphemous language before them, you can be sure that these younger people will follow your example and not your precept. It is no use to preach to them if you do not act decently yourself. You must feel that the most effective way in which you can preach is by your practice. As I was driving up here, a friend who was with us said that in his experience, the boy who went out into life with a foul tongue was apt so to go because his kinfolk, at least his intimate associates themselves, had foul tongues. The father, the elder brothers, the friends can do much towards seeing that the boys as they become men become clean and honorable men. I have told you that I wanted you not only to be decent, but to be strong. These boys will not admire virtue of a merely anemic type. They believe in courage, in manliness. They admire those who have the quality of being brave, the quality of facing life as life should be faced, the quality that must stand at the root of good citizenship in peace or in war. If you are to be effective as good Christians, you must possess strength and courage or your example will count for little with the young who admire strength and courage. I want to see you, the men of the Holy Name Society, you who embody the qualities which the younger people admire, by your example, give those young people the tendency, the trend in the right direction, and remember that this example counts in many other ways besides cleanliness of speech. I want to see every man able to hold his own with the strong, and also ashamed to oppress the weak. I want to see each young fellow able to do a man's work in the world, and of a type which will not permit imposition to be permitted upon him. I want to see him too strong of spirit to submit to wrong, and on the other hand ashamed to do wrong to others. I want to see each man able to hold his own in the rough work of actual life outside, and also when he is at home, a good man, unselfish in dealing with his wife or mother or children. Remember that the preaching does not count if it is not backed up by practice. There is no good in your preaching to your boys to be brave if you run away. There is no good in your preaching to them to tell the truth if you do not. There is no good in your preaching to them to be unselfish if they see you selfish with your wife, disregardful of others. We have a right to expect that you will come together in meetings like this, that you will march in processions, that you will join in building up such a great and useful association as this. And even more, we have a right to expect that in your homes and among your own associates, you will prove by your deeds that yours is not a lip loyalty merely, that you show in actual practice the faith that is in you. End of Strength and Decency by Theodore Roosevelt Read by Michael Basilian Ten Types of Clouds An excerpt from Clouds by the National Weather Service, 2020 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How Clouds Form There are two ingredients needed for clouds to become visible. Water, of course, and nuclei. Nuclei In one form or another, water is always present in the atmosphere. However, water molecules in the atmosphere are too small to bond together for the formation of cloud droplets. They need a flatter surface, an object with a radius of at least one micrometer, one millionth of a meter, on which they can form a bond. Those objects are called nuclei. Nuclei are minute solid and liquid particles found in abundance. 
they consist of such things as smoke particles from fires or volcanoes ocean spray or tiny specks of wind-blown soil these nuclei are hygroscopic meaning they attract water molecules called cloud condensation nuclei these water molecule attracting particles are about one one hundredth the size of a cloud droplet upon which water condenses therefore every cloud droplet has a speck of dirt dust or salt crystal at its core but even with a condensation nuclei the cloud droplet is essentially made up of pure water temperatures roll but having water attracting nuclei is not enough for a cloud to form as the air temperature needs to be below the saturation point called the dew point temperature the point of saturation is where evaporation equals condensation therefore a cloud results when a block of air called a parcel containing water vapor has cooled below the point of saturation air can reach the point of saturation in a number of ways the most common way is through lifting of air from the surface up into the atmosphere as a bubble of air called a parcel rises it moves into lower pressure since pressure decreases with height the result is the parcel expands in size as it rises this requires heat energy to be removed from the parcel called an adiabatic process as air rises and expands it cools the rate at which the parcel cools with increasing elevation is called the lapse rate the lapse rate the rate the temperature lapses or decreases of unsaturated air air with relative humidity less than 100 percent is 5.5 degrees fahrenheit per 1000 feet parentheses 9.8 degrees celsius per kilometer and parentheses called the dry lapse rate for each 1000 feet increase in elevation the air temperature will decrease 5.5 degrees fahrenheit once the parcel reaches saturation temperature 100 percent relative humidity water vapor will condense onto the cloud condensation nuclei resulting in the formation of a cloud droplet but the atmosphere is in constant motion as air rises drier air is added and trained into the rising parcel so both condensation and evaporation are continually occurring so cloud droplets are constantly forming and dissipating therefore clouds form and grow when there is more condensation on nuclei than evaporation from nuclei conversely they dissipate if there is more evaporation than condensation thus clouds appear and disappear as well as constantly change shape the four core types of clouds while clouds appear in infinite shapes and sizes they fall into some basic forms from his essay of the modification of clouds 1803 luke howard divided clouds into three categories cirrus cumulus and stratus cirro form the latin word cirro means curl of hair composed of ice crystals cirro form clouds are whitish and hair-like they are the high wispy clouds to first appear in advance of a low pressure area such as a mid-latitude storm system or a tropical system such as a hurricane cumulo form generally detached clouds they look like white fluffy cotton balls they show vertical motion or thermal uplift of air taking place in the atmosphere they are usually dense in appearance with sharp outlines the base of cumulus clouds are generally flat and occurs at the altitude where the moisture in rising air condenses 
stratoform from the latin word for layer these clouds are usually broad and fairly widespread appearing like a blanket they result from non-convective rising air and tend to occur along and to the north of warm fronts the edges of stratoform clouds are diffuse nimble form howard also designated a special rainy cloud category which combined the three forms cumulo plus cirro plus stratus he called this cloud nimbus the latin word for rain the vast majority of precipitation occurs from nimble form clouds and therefore these clouds have the highest vertical height ten basic clouds based on his observations luke howard suggested there were modifications or combinations of the core four clouds between categories he noticed that clouds often have features of two or more categories cirrus plus stratus cumulus plus stratus etc his research served as the starting point for the ten basic types of clouds we observe from the world meteorological organizations wmo international cloud atlas the official worldwide standard for clouds the following are definitions of the ten basic cloud types divided by their height the ten types of clouds are high level clouds cirrus ci cirrocumulus cc and cirrostratus cs are high level clouds they are typically thin and white in appearance but can appear in a magnificent array of colors when the sun is low on the horizon cirrus ci detached clouds in the form of white delicate filaments mostly white patches or narrow bands they may have a fibrous hair-like and or silky sheen appearance cirrus clouds are always composed of ice crystals and their transparent character depends upon the degree of separation of the crystals as a rule when these clouds cross the sun's disk they hardly diminish its brightness when they are exceptionally thick they may veil its light and obliterate its contour before sunrise and after sunset cirrus is often colored bright yellow or red these clouds are lit up long before other clouds and fade out much later sometime after sunset they become gray at all hours of the day cirrus near the horizon is often of a yellowish color this is due to distance and to the great thickness of air traversed by the rays of light cirrocumulus c c thin white patch sheet or layered of clouds without shading they are composed of very small elements in the form of more or less regularly arranged grains or ripples most of these elements have an apparent width of less than one degree approximately width of the little finger at arm's length in general cirrocumulus represents a degraded state of cirrus and cirrostratus both of which may change into it and is an uncommon cloud there will be a connection with cirrus or cirrostratus and will show some characteristics of ice crystal clouds cirrostratus c s transparent whitish veil clouds with a fibrous hair-like or smooth appearance a sheet of cirrostratus which is very extensive nearly always ends by covering the whole sky during the day when the sun is sufficiently high above the horizon the sheet is never thick enough to prevent shadows of objects on the ground a milky veil of fog or thin stratus is distinguished from a veil of cirrostratus of a similar appearance by the halo phenomena which the sun or the moon nearly always produces in a layer of cirrostratus mid-level clouds alto cumulus a c alto stratus a s and nimbostratus n s 
are mid-level clouds they are composed primarily of water droplets however they can also be composed of ice crystals when temperatures are low enough in latin alto means high yet alto stratus and alto cumulus clouds are classified as mid-level clouds alto is used to distinguish these quotes high level end quotes clouds and their low level liquid based counterpart clouds stratus and cumulus alto cumulus ac white and or gray patch sheet or layered clouds generally composed of laminae plates rounded masses or rolls they may be partly fibrous or diffuse and may or may not be merged most of these regularly arranged small elements have an apparent width of one to five degrees larger than the little finger and smaller than three fingers at arm's length when the edge or a thin semi-transparent patch of alto cumulus passes in front of the sun or moon a corona appears this colored ring has red on the outside and blue inside and occurs within a few degrees of the sun or moon the most common mid cloud more than one layer of alto cumulus often appears at different levels at the same time Many times, alto cumulus will appear with other cloud types. Alto stratus, A-S, gray or bluish cloud sheets or layers of striated or fibrous clouds that totally or partially covers the sky. They are thin enough to regularly reveal the sun as if seen through ground glass alto stratus clouds do not produce a halo phenomenon nor are the shadows of objects on the ground visible sometimes virga is seen hanging from alto stratus and at times may even reach the ground causing very light precipitation nimbostratus n s resulting from thickening alto stratus this is a dark gray cloud layer diffused by falling rain or snow it is thick enough throughout to blot out the sun also low ragged clouds frequently occur beneath this cloud which sometimes merges with its base the cloud base lowers as precipitation continues because of the lowering base it is often erroneously called a low-level cloud both alto stratus and nimbo stratus can extend into the high level of clouds. Low level clouds, cumulus, cu, stratocumulus, sc, stratus, st, and cumulonimbus, cb, are low level clouds composed of water droplets. Cumulonimbus, with its strong vertical updraft, extends well into the high level of clouds cumulus cu detached generally dense clouds and with sharp outlines that develop vertically in the form of rising mounds domes or towers with bulging upper parts often resembling a cauliflower the sunlit parts of these clouds are mostly brilliant white while their bases are relatively dark and horizontal over land cumulus develops on days of clear skies and is due diurnal convection it appears in the morning grows and then more or less dissolves again toward evening cumulonimbus c b the thunderstorm cloud this is a heavy and dense cloud in the form of a mountain or huge tower the upper portion is usually smoothed fibrous or striated and nearly always flattened in the shape of an anvil or vast plume under the base of this cloud which is often very dark there are often low ragged clouds that may or may not merge with the base they produce precipitation which sometimes is in the form of virga cumulonimbus clouds also produce hail and tornadoes stratocumulus sc gray or whitish patch sheet 
or layered clouds which almost always have dark tessellations honeycomb appearance rounded masses or rolls except for virga they are non-fibrous and may or may not be merged they also have regularly arranged small elements with an apparent width of more than five degrees three fingers at arm's length stratus s t a generally gray cloud layer with a uniform base which may if thick enough produce drizzle ice prisms or snow grains when the sun is visible through this cloud its outline is clearly discernible often when a layer of stratus breaks up and dissipates blue sky is seen sometimes appearing as ragged sheets stratus clouds do not produce a halo phenomenon except occasionally at very low temperatures end of ten types of clouds an excerpt from clouds by the national weather service 2020 read for librivox by sue anderson tetzel's theses on indulgences by john tetzel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org first disputation of john tetzel in order that the truth may appear and errors be suppressed and after due consideration objections against catholic truth be answered brother john tetzel of the order of preachers bachelor of sacred theology and inquisitor of heretical pravity will sustain the subscribed propositions in the most distinguished university at frankfurt on order to the praise of god for the defence of the catholic faith and for the honour of the holy apostolic see one our lord jesus christ wished to teach all the sacraments of the new law by which he wished all to be bound after his passion and ascension two and he wished to teach all before his passion by his most suitable proclamation three therefore he errs whoever says that christ when he proclaimed repent ye wished inward repentance and outward mortification of the flesh in such wise for that he could not also teach or at the same time understand the sacrament of penance and its parts confession and satisfaction as obligatory nay verily it avails nothing even if inward penance works outward mortification unless confession and satisfaction are accompanied by deed and prayer five this satisfaction since god does not allow a transgression without a penalty is made through penalty or its equivalent in the divine acceptance six what is imposed either by the will of the priest or by canon is sometimes enforced by divine justice here or is remitted in purgatory seven just as no one is bound to repeat a confession truly made for the same offence save in few cases eight and however useful it might be nevertheless neither priest nor pope can demand that it be repeated nine so one absolved is not bound to repeat for the same sins the outward satisfying penance when once rightly performed to command the contrary is to err ten notwithstanding he is bound as long as he lives to grieve within in conduct and disposition and always to detest remitted sin and not to live without fear concerning propitiation of sins eleven this penalty imposed on account of sins repented and confessed the pope can completely remit by means of indulgences twelve whether this has been imposed by him or by the will of the priest or by canon or even is exacted by the divine justice to deny this is to err thirteen but although through indulgences every penalty in matters determined is remitted which is due for sins 
so that it is vindicative of them. 14. He errs, nevertheless, who thinks that because of this the penalty is removed that is healthful and preservative, since the jubilee is not ordained contrary to this. 15. However truly and entirely any one may receive remission through indulgences, he who denies that this can be done in matters determined errs. 16. Nevertheless, no one ought to intermit works of satisfaction as long as he lives, since they are curative of sins remaining, preservative from future sins, and meritorious. 17. Just as the Mosaic sacraments are barren elements, neither removing guilt nor justifying. 18. So the Jewish priests have neither keys nor office, whence they can remit guilt. 19. But the Christian sacraments produce the grace they signify, and hence also justify those who receive them. 20. And Christian priests have the true office and keys by which they can remit even guilt. 21. Not only by approving and declaring, as the priests of the old law of Aaron did with regard to leprosy, 22, but also ministerially and instrumentally, and by orderly performing the thing itself by means of the sacrament. 23. Nay, just as God has keys of authority, Christ of excellence, so the Christian priest has ministerial keys. 24. Whosoever says, therefore, that the Pope, or even the least priest, has no power over guilt, save in approving or declaring, errs. 25. Nay, he errs who does not believe that the least Christian priest has more power in regard to sin than the whole synagogue of the Jews formerly had. 26. What does not he err then, who thinks that Christ, so far as he has not bound his power to the sacraments, 27, cannot remit sins by the excellence of his key, and save a man apart from sacerdotal confession, approbation, or declaration? 28. Although contempt, true or inferred, has rejected the sacrament, which not seldom happens in late repentance, 29. Neither unexpected death nor necessity exempt from the severest punishment that follows. 30. Nevertheless, we must not despair concerning these, since the least contrition that can take place at the end of life, 31, suffices for the remission of sins and the changing of the eternal penalty to a temporal. 32. But seeing that, on account of deficiency of time, the most cruel punishments not infrequently befall those who have died in such wise, 33, which are quickly remitted by plenary indulgences, such act foolishly as dissuade from buying confessional licenses. 34. Because of violence to a priest, penalties are imposed on the excommunicate, incendiaries and incestuous not alone after absolution but sometimes after death thirty five on the one an oath not to repeat on the other satisfaction therefore he who denies that this can be done errs thirty six not by sleeping bishops but by chapters of the canon law a priest is commanded to be discreet and pious so that one confessed is sent to purgatory thirty seven with the penalty of exile willingly received rather than to hell as rejected. He who calls that tears, therefore errs. 38. Heretics, schismatics, and traitors are excommunicated after death, anathematized and exhumed. 39. Therefore, whoever says that those about to die pay all debts by death and are not held by the canon law, errs. 40. It is erroneous to say that souls about to be purified, who depart in grace and charity, which separates between the sons of the kingdom and those of perdition, and far more of despair, 41, are near despair, but rather one should say they are in firm hope of obtaining happiness. 42, he errs who says that it is not proved either by reason or scripture that the purified are beyond the state of merit. 43, he errs who adds that it is not proved how certain and secure they are of their happiness. Likewise, he who says, 44, the souls about to be purified cannot be more certain of their salvation than we, and that we are most certain. 45. He errs who says that the Pope does not mean by plenary remission, the remission of all penalties, but only those imposed by himself. 
46, to say that the preachers of indulgences err when they declare that a man may be relieved of all penalty by the indulgence of the Pope and be saved, is an error. 47. To say that the Pope can remit no penalty to souls in purgatory, which they ought to remove in this life according to the canons, is an error. 48. He errs who says that only the most perfect can obtain pardons, and not also the perfect, the still more perfect, beginners and progressive. 49. Likewise also, whoever says that not only the fully contrite, but the impenitent, and the contrite through confession can obtain pardons. 50. He errs whoever says this can happen to very few and not to most who do what the jubilee requires. 51. It is an error to assert that the Pope has no greater or more efficacious power over purgatory by imparting generally the jubilee in form of intercession, 52, than such or as great as any bishop or priest has, especially in his own diocese or parish. 53. Even if the Pope have no power of the keys over purgatory, he nevertheless has the authority to apply the jubilee to them by way of intercession. 54. To deny this power over purgatory in the Pope, under the form of the key, is to contradict the truth and to err. 55. For a soul to fly out is for it to obtain the vision of God, which can be hindered by no interruption. 56. Therefore he errs who says that the soul cannot fly out before the coin can jingle in the bottom of the chest. 57. It is an error to find gain and avarice in public intercession, and not to seek the effect of purgation. 58. It is a manifest error to doubt if all souls wish to be redeemed, or being redeemed to escape purgatory. 59. With regard to conjectural security, as far as human weakness attains, it is an error to hold that no one is certain of obtaining pardon, even those who have done what the jubilee requires. 60. It is an error to say that only a few and not most of those who fulfill the jubilee requirements obtain pardons. 61. It is an error to say that one released through plenary pardon, according to the form of the decretal, is not certain of his salvation, just as if truly penitent and confessed. 62. It is an error to hold that a man is not reconciled to God by papal indulgences duly acquired by every form, just as if truly penitent and confessed. 63. It is an error to teach men not to look for pardoning grace, except for penalties of satisfaction imposed by man, and not also those imposed by the canon or divine justice. 64. It is an error to say that it is not a Christian doctrine that those who are about to buy confessional licenses or the jubilee indulgence for their friends in purgatory can do these things without repentance. 65. It is an error to hold that any Christian whatever, truly penitent, has, quickly and completely, plenary remission of penalty and guilt without indulgences. 66. It is an error to say that any Christian whatever, whether living or dead, has a share in all benefits, and to the extent of an authoritative remission of sins. 67. It is an error to hold that there is the same share in all benefits through charity as through the power of having mediation. 68. Again, it is an error to say that there is the same share for all benefits for acquiring and increasing merits as for giving satisfaction. 69. It is an error to say that the remission of the Pope and the share in all benefits are not to be despised only because declaration is made of the divine remission. 70. It is an error to say that it is very easy only for the most learned theologians, and not also for those moderately versed, at once to exalt the ample effects of pardons and the necessity of true contrition. 71. He errs who does not know that, instead of those satisfying penalties that contrition seeks, Christ's pardons impose compensatory penalties, but because they do not remit those that are medicative, contrition has the penalties that it loves continuing through the whole life. 72. 
works of charity avail more in obtaining merit, but plenary pardons more in quickly making satisfaction and obtaining total remission. He errs who does not know this, or does not believe it, and who teaches the people one and is silent about the other. 73. Plenary indulgences avail more in making satisfaction and obtaining remission completely, quickly, and remarkably, but works of charity avail more in obtaining merit, grace, and chiefly in increasing glory. He errs who does not think the Pope wishes the people to be so taught. 74. But since plenary indulgence differs exceedingly from particular works of mercy, as they are commonly called, he is guilty of signal presumption and error, who teaches the people that the Pope wishes the purchase of pardons to be in no way compared with so-called works of mercy. 75. Giving to the poor and lending to the needy is doing better as to the increase of merit, but buying pardons is better as to more speedy making satisfaction. He errs who teaches the people otherwise and leads them astray. Likewise, he who thinks that to buy pardons is not also a work of mercy. 76. Although by pardons a man may first become freer from punishment, nevertheless, since the work by which they are bought becomes one of charity, he who buys becomes better in consequence of his internal devotion. He doubly errs who teaches the people otherwise. 77. Spiritual arms are preferred to corporal and are more commonly given. Whence, if one needs pardon and cannot aid the poor without danger of want, he does far better by buying than by helping the poor, as said before. He who teaches the contrary errs. 78. Merit and extent of merit are generally approved according to the importance of works and the purpose of charity. Therefore, he deserves pardon more who obtains them from necessaries than he who obtains them from superfluities. Whence he doubly errs who teaches that anyone sins in acquiring merit in this way. 79. Although the buying of pardons has not been commanded, it is nevertheless the wisest course for those who need them. Whoever says the former and is silent about the latter leads the people astray and errs. 80. What need Leo more than others has of prayer for himself can only be conjectured, but we are bound to pray for Pope Leo by the obligation of both human and divine law. And since that is done as a matter of necessity, he errs who says that on account of it the Pope ought to grant indulgences. 82. Unless faith, devotion, nay confidence, are cherished with regard to pardons, indulgences amount to nothing and are useless. Whoever says the contrary errs most seriously. 83. Since the sums exacted for pardons under Leo are very small, as compared with his predecessors, therefore he errs impiously who says that he is planning to build the church of St. Peter's with the flesh, skin, and bones of his own sheep. 84. Indulgences are useful to him who does what lies in him, and according to the tenor of the bulls. However, it may happen that railers err. Therefore, it is a most abominable error to say that confidence in salvation through letters of pardon is vain, even if the Pope were to put his own soul in pawn for them. 86. If the least bishop can impose silence on others, either while he himself wishes to preach, or to have someone preach before him, 87. It is a very grave error to say that the Pope is the enemy of the cross if he wishes to publish the Jubilee in a like manner. 88. If the legends of the saints may without harm be read on their feast days at greater length than the gospel, one can continue to publish pardons an equal or longer time than the reading of the gospel. To say the contrary is to err doubly. 89. It is an error to say the mind of the Pope is that pardons should be celebrated with single bells, processions and ceremonies, the gospel with a hundred bells, processions and ceremonies. 90. It is an error to say that the treasury of the church, whence the Pope grants indulgences, is not sufficiently named or known. 91. It is an error to say that the treasury of Christ is not the merits of Christ and the saints. 92. It is an error to say that these works pardoning that is sufficient on the side of God, 
quick and complete satisfaction without the mediation of the Pope. 93. To say that the treasure of the church was the poor in the time of St. Lawrence is an error. 94. To say that the treasure of the church is only the keys of the church given by the merit of Christ is an error. 95. It is an error to say that the power of the Pope alone suffices for the remission of penalties without intervention of the treasury of the church, that is, of the merits of Christ. 96. The gospel, the gift of healing, and the sacraments of pardon are alike called by the name of grace. To proclaim the one and neglect the other is to err. 97. It is an error to say that the indulgences that preachers proclaim to be the greatest graces are truly such as to promoting gain. 98. Yea, to teach that the treasuries of indulgences are nets with which they fish for the riches of men is a most impious error. 99. And since a sin committed against the mother of Christ, however enormous, is less than if the same were committed against the Son, which is remissible by the express testimony of Christ. 100. Therefore, whoever says that such a sin cannot be remitted in the truly contrite by indulgences, is mad, raves, and errs against the text of the gospel and Christ himself. 101. Moreover, to propose to the sub-commissaries and preachers of pardon, that if by an impossibility any one should violate the ever-Virgin Mother of God, they could absolve the same by the power of indulgences. It is clearer than light that the one so proposing against the evident truth is moved by hatred and thirsts for the blood of his brethren. 102. To lay down also in public propositions that preachers of pardons, although never heard, overflow before the people with excess of words and consume more time in explaining pardons than in preaching the gospel, is to sow falsehoods heard from others and invented for truth, and he who quickly believes shows himself thereby to be fickle and errs grievously. 103. In fine, to lay down in public propositions that preachers of pardons are so far wanting through their licentious preaching as to make it no easy task even for learned men to secure a respect for the Pope from the questions of acute laymen, is, after first bringing contumely upon the Pope, to flatter him and openly insinuate that all the rest have obtained safely and that he alone makes trouble, and in this to err exceedingly. 104. It belongs to grace formally to remit guilt, effectively and chiefly by God, regularly, though insufficiently, by a pure man, satisfactorily by Christ, instrumentally by the sacraments. Whoever therefore says the Pope cannot remit the least venial sin as to guilt errs. 105. He who denies that the same power belongs to Peter and all his vicars, errs. Whoever thinks Peter has more power over pardons than Leo errs greatly, yea, blasphemes. 106. He errs who says, just as he who adores the cross of Christ, or any image whatsoever, as a thing and not as a sign, offers divine worship, likewise that the cross of Christ excels among however many others as objects of adoration, and ought to be venerated more. Nevertheless, he who offers divine worship to other things, and does not equally adore that cross, represented also in the papal arms, is guilty of idolatry and error. Second Disputation of John Tetzel Brother John Tetzel of the Order of Preachers, Bachelor of Sacred Theology and Inquisitor of Heretical Pravity, will publicly and briefly defend and dispute the subscribed propositions at the University of Frankfurt on order, on a certain day that will be named at the earliest possible time, whoever ought to be censured as heretic, schismatic, obstinate, contumacious, erroneous, seditious, ill-expressing, rash, and injurious, at the first look, will be clearly seen in them. To the praise of God and the honour of the Holy Apostolic See in the year of our salvation, 1517. 1. Christians should be taught that since the power of the Pope is supreme in the Church and was instituted by God alone, it can be restrained or increased by no mere man, nor by the whole world together, but by God only. 2. 
Christians should be taught that they are bound to render simple obedience to the Pope, who holds them all in his immediate jurisdiction in respect to those things that pertain to the Christian religion and to his chair, if they are consonant with divine and natural law. 3. Christians should be taught that the Pope, by authority of his jurisdiction, is superior to the entire Catholic Church and its councils, and that they should humbly obey his statutes. 4. Christians should be taught that the Pope has the sole power of deciding those things that are of faith, and that he and no other may interpret the sense of Holy Scripture as to its meaning, and that he has the power to approve or disapprove all the words or works of others. 5. Christians should be taught that the judgment of the Pope, in those matters that are of faith and necessary to man's salvation, cannot err in the least. 6. Christians should be taught that even if the Pope should err in faith concerning the things that are of faith, by holding a bad opinion, he will not err concerning those things that are of faith when he pronounces judgment upon them. 7. Christians should be taught that the decisions of the Pope, which he publishes as to matters that are of faith, ought to have more weight in a cause than the decisions of any number of wise men regarding the doctrines of the Scriptures. 8. Christians should be taught that the Pope deserves always and humbly to be honoured by them and not to be injured. 9. Christians should be taught that those who derogate from the honour and authority of the Pope incur the penalty of the curse and the crime of treason. 10. Christians should be taught that those who expose the Pope to jeers and slanders are marked with the stain of heresy and shut out from hope of the kingdom of heaven. 11. Christians should be taught that those who dishonour the Pope are punished with temporal disgrace and also with the worst death and scandalous disorder. 12. Christians should be taught that the keys of the Church do not belong to the universal Church, as the assembly of all believers is called, but to Peter and the Pope, and have been bestowed on all their successors and on all prelates to come through derivation from them. 13. Christians should be taught that a general council cannot give plenary indulgence, nor other prelates of the church together or singly, but the Pope alone, who is the bridegroom of the church universal. 14. Christians should be taught that no mortals can determine the truth and faith concerning the obtaining of indulgences. No, not even a general council, but the Pope alone, who has the power to render final judgment concerning Catholic truth. 15. Christians should be taught that Catholic truth is called universal truth, and that it ought to be believed by Christ's faithful ones, and that it contains nothing of either falsehood or of iniquity. 16. Christians should be taught that the Church holds many things as Catholic truths, which are by no means contained in the same form of words in the canon of Holy Scripture of the Old and New Testaments. 17. Christians should be taught that the Church hold many things as Catholic truths, which nevertheless are not laid down as such either in the biblical canon or by earlier teachers. 18. Christians should be taught that all observances regarding matters of faith, defined by the decision of the Apostolic See, are to be reckoned among Catholic truths, although not found to be contained in the canon of Holy Scripture. 19. Christians should be taught that those things that teachers approved by the Church have positively handed down concerning the holding of the faith and the confuting of heretics, although they are not expressly contained in the canon of Holy Scripture, their writings of this character are nevertheless to be reckoned among Catholic truths. 20. Christians should be taught that although certain truths may not be absolutely Catholic, they nonetheless smack of Catholic truth. 21. Christians should be taught that all those smack of heresy who say that no use of the cross of Christ should be made in the churches. 22. Christians should be taught that those who cherish deliberate doubts concerning the faith should be most clearly condemned as heretics. 23. Christians should be taught that those who are ordained to holy orders for money may most clearly be called heretics. 24. Christians should be taught that all who interpret the Holy Scripture badly, and not as the sense of the Holy Spirit demands, by whom it has been written, may most justly be called heretics. 25. 
Christians should be taught that he most properly be called a heretic, who for the sake of temporal glory either originates or follows false and new doctrines. 26. Christians should be taught that all those are most justly called heretics who attempt to take away the privilege of the Roman Church, delivered by the highest head of all churches. 27. Christians should be taught that, after the example of the blessed Ambrose, they ought to follow in all things as their master, the holy Roman Church, and not their own imaginings. 28. Christians should be taught that, Whosoever persistently defends his own perverse and depraved doctrine against the rule of Catholic truth should be condemned as a heretic and be proclaimed such by all. 29. Christians should be taught that those who teach anything as certain which cannot be validly proved either by reason or by authority must be condemned as rash. 30. Christians should be taught that those who assert at any time what things are false are to be held as in error. 31. Christians should be taught that those who draw away any one of the faithful or some notable person should be condemned as injurious. 32. Christians should be taught that those who write propositions that furnish occasion of disaster to those who hear, whatever qualification may be added, are truly to be held, as if they published them absolutely and without qualification, to be causes of offence, sayers of evil, and offenders of pious ears, in so far as they seem to urge heretical propositions. 33. Christians should be taught that assertions of teachers that bring in schism among the people, as is that proposition, one should not obey a bad prelate or prince, or one should not believe the Pope and his bulls, are by all means seditious. 34. Christians should be taught that all who originate false doctrines and defend them persistently should properly be condemned as heretics. 35. Christians should be taught that all who, in contempt of the divine law, are either inventors of persistent error or followers of another, who would rather be opponents of Catholic truth than its subjects, should certainly be condemned as heretics. 36. Christians should be taught that all defenders of others' errors err not alone as to that, but also make ready for others stumbling blocks of error, and show that they should not only be held to be heretics, but even arch-heretics. 37. Christians should be taught that those who originate new doctrines contrary to Catholic truth, which they may be pertinacious to hold, and because of them depart from the common life, from either fickleness or perversity, because this proceeds from pride, which properly is the love of superiority, even if they are not influenced by any desire of temporal advantage, they are nevertheless without doubt to be held as heretics. 38. Christians should be taught that those who adhere to the doctrines of scholars, contrary to Catholic truth, err obstinately and sin in erring, and thereby come to be condemned as heretics. 39. Christians should be taught that those who deny any Catholic truth whatsoever, which is published as Catholic among the faithful with whom they associate, and is publicly proclaimed by preachers of the word of God, are said to be obstinate in their error. 40. Christians should be taught that those who deny the assertions which they know to be contained in Holy Scripture or in the decision of the Church must be condemned as obstinate in their heresy. 41. Christians should be taught that those who do not correct or amend their error, whenever it has been shown them in a lawful manner that their error opposes Catholic truth, must be condemned as contumacious in their heresy. 42. Christians should be taught that they must be condemned as obstinate in their error, who, erring against the Catholic faith and the decision of the Church, proudly refuse to submit themselves to the correction and amendation of him to whom the duty belongs. 43. Christians should be taught that those who have been reproved for some plain error against the faith and refuse to be informed concerning the truth are in error and should be proclaimed as obstinate in this sort of heresy. 44. Christians should be taught that those who protest in words, deeds, or writings that they are not at all willing to revoke their heretical assertions, even if those whose duty it is should reign or hail excommunications against such opinions, are to be held as obstinate heretics and are to be shunned by all. 45. 
Christians should be taught that those who invent or defend new errors in defense of heretical pravity, in as far as they are not ready to be corrected, and to seek truth with careful solicitude, are certainly to be held as obstinate in their heresies. 46. Christians should be taught that those beneath the chief pontiff, if they formally define a certain assertion as heretical, or decide that it must be held, and impose it upon others because they deem it to be Catholic, are to be held and proclaimed as obstinate heretics, one and all who agree with such decisions of theirs. 47. Christians should be taught that they obstinately err, who have the power to resist heretical pravity, and yet do not resist it, and that by this course they themselves befriend the errors of heresy. 48. Christians should be taught that those who defend the error of heretics, and effect this by their own power, should beware, lest they come into the hands of the judge to be tried, as excommunicates, and if they do not make satisfaction within a year, be held by their own law as infamous, who are also, according to the chapters of the law, terribly punished, with many penalties, to the terror of all men. 49. Christians should be taught not to be influenced in their faith about the authority of the Pope and his indulgences by the boldness of obstinate heretics, for our pious Lord and God would not have permitted heretics to arise, except that truth might appear more clear to faith by their arising, and we might by this means escape from irrational infancy, but they should rather continue credulous regarding the truth preached concerning the parts of penance and indulgences, through which constancy on their part in the aforesaid faith, the approbation of them by God may be made clear and evident to the whole world. 50. And so those who wish as much as they can to fill letters and books concerning the parts of penance, confession of the mouth and satisfaction by works brought in and instituted by God and the gospel, and promulgated by apostles, and approved and followed by the whole church, and yet impugned by my adversary unrighteously and irreligiously in his common speech in so many articles, and concerning plenary indulgence and the power of the chief Roman pontiff with regard to the same, and wish with a certain unrestrainable cheek to preach publicly or dispute concerning them, to win favour for their writings, scatter them among the people, and make them common throughout the world, or to speak impudently and by way of contempt concerning these very things, in corners or in part before men, let them fear for themselves lest they fall upon the foregoing propositions, and through this expose themselves and others to the perils of damnation and of severe temporal disorder. For a beast that has touched the mountain shall be stoned. End of Tetzel's Theses on Indulgences by John Tetzel